This episode of the podcast presented by Enhanced. Great news, Snags. Enhanced CBD Recovery Oil is launching May 22nd. 22nd of May. May 22nd. Mate, deal. I heard if you head to the boys' Instagram bio, there's a little bit of a VIP access list that you can uh, sign up to so you don't miss out. Is that true? Mate, that is 100% true. Jump on their Instagram bio, sign up for that VIP access list. But Snags, they've also got their enhanced hemp muscle and training tees, both now available online. Look, I don't forget about that because I do remember the old hemp fiber is four times stronger than cotton, super comfy to wear, UV resistant, odor resistant so you can train it as well, get sweaty and not smell. And DL, I have you know, it's unique breathable fibers, has also the ability to cool and insulate at the same time, my friend, depending what you need. Get it? Mate, for more information, head to enhance.com. That's E N H A N C D.com and use that discount code Run It Back at checkout for 20% off your order. Now to the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Runner Back Podcast, episode number 25, coming at you this week, and oh my god, boys, we've just come off the back of some fights, we're back, baby. I don't know if anyone was more excited for episode 25 dropping as they were for uh, the fights on the weekend, but I'm excited for both, I'm excited to talk about the boys, and also talk about some more fights with the boys, so before I get too excited, because I've said that word 48 times, introduce my co-host, who I'll probably introduce another 48 times over the next couple of weeks, DL, how are we? I'm good, Snags. Yeah, mate. I'm too excited. Yeah, you are very excited. Mate, it's probably because of the fights on the weekend. It's understandable. Uh, I'm kind of pinching myself still from the weekend's fights. Yeah, and we had some absolute wars too, which was crazy. But won't go into it too much because I know the boys are going to cover it off in the podcast. Before I get too deep into it, did drop another interview podcast last week. Um, we had the boys from Eternal MMA, Cam O'Neill and Ben Vickers on it. It was awesome just to hear, um, I think, the different perspective for us as we had the promoters on and not the fighters. Um, so it's cool to hear about the journey of Eternal MMA and where it come from, from the start to where it is now. And it's it's grown to one of Australia's, well, Australia's premier MMA promotions. So it was cool to hear straight from the horse's mouth. The horses, both of them, <laughs> uh, how they got there. And it was, I mean, it was an awesome chat. I enjoyed every second of it. Yeah, it was great. And we've got another really cool interview lined up for the 21st of this month. I think it's been on our socials, so we can say we've got uh, the fight dietitian, Geordie Sullivan, popping on. Uh, we recorded it uh, last week. Hey, he is the smartest man alive. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Dropping some feel. knowledge. <laughs> he did. That whole podcast, wasn't yeah. he? So if uh, you want to catch up on the combat nutrition, Geordie's your man. So that comes out on the 21st, so check that out. But on today's podcast, regular segments are back. Hot take. Update the leaderboard, because we didn't do it on the last potty. So we get a little leaderboard update, and uh, we'll catch that with the fights from the weekend. Craig starts breaking news with Stoney. Back by popular demand. ISO chats. I reckon it was that jazz music. Got a newish segment. We'll see how it goes, but hashtag snags value. A couple of the boys on the weekend got on that. We had a couple of Twitter comments about that. Yeah, that was good. We've got a couple of cards this week. On the back of COVID, we've, uh, now the UFC is in full swing. We've got two cards to look for in one week. We've got a card. We're going to talk Australian time here since we're an Australian podcast. Thursday afternoon. It's not bad for oh. someone that's got days off work. That'll be all right. Midweek. And uh, Saturday afternoon. It should be uh, Sunday afternoon. Sorry. Sunday for us, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of two cards, DL, we've got two special co-hosts to introduce as well. Stoney has joined us uh, from about, I reckon it's about 200 metres away from my house in his own house. Stoney, <laughs> how's things? <laughs> things are good, DL. It's good, good to be back at the boys together. I've got to admit, a bit of post-UFC 249 blues were setting in after the event yesterday, just knowing that nothing else at all see for the next few months is going to live up to what what we saw yesterday so uh it's good to good to get the podcast back and and, and relive all the action it's going to be a it's going to be a good one firmly agree mate we've got the man behind the microphone the man that provides everything it's that man how are we i'm doing well and i am i'm still super excited that we actually got to see some fights on the weekend um it was very very exciting it felt like we might not see fights ever again at some points but we finally got some and i was so happy. Yeah, I think we're all very, very happy. We're trying to talk Craig off the cliff. <laughs> Mate, you were so <laughs> negative. Ray, Susan, we had a man, conversation with me. Craig That's about uh, positivity. 
<laughs> but Craig, don't talk that negative shit. I was devastated. Chat. We got through though. We got through. We got through. Anyway, boys, we might kick into this podcast with our brand new episode of ISO Chat with Snags. Oh yeah. This is when my jazz music comes in. So boys, I'm changing it up this week. I know last week we just did an update of where everyone's at considering isolation, but I've got uh, a question for each of you this week. Um, just one sole question. And I'll uh, kick it off with the stat man himself. Stat man, knowing that it's been your lifelong dream of being a ring announcer, what would be your ultimate fight to call and how would you prepare for it? Uh, so my favorite fighters are both very similar fighters. I would go with Frankie Edgar versus Dominic Cruz. Um, I would love to call that fight because there'd be plenty of action. I would say I'd li- like it to be at featherweight. Just their movement, speed, and output second to none. So pretty much guaranteed to be a five-round technical clinic. Both can wrestle, both can strike. Uh, Frank Yeager, just to drop a little stat on you, Frank Yeager has the largest fight time in UFC history at over five hours. Um, so I'd probably do some research by watching the fights all the way from the beginning of it. I could squirrel away 10 hours on a day before the fights to watch all of Frank Yeager and Dominic Cruz's fights leading into the fight. Uh, and I think a lot of them have a lot of similarities, so I'd just be leading into that. So I definitely think uh, UFC Fight Pass would come in handy <laughs> the day, the day, in the days leading up to it. But I would absolutely, I would die a happy man calling that fight. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we'll actually ever get that fight. I don't think so. I don't uh, think so. If we, if we ever are lucky enough to, maybe we'll have to do a run it back video where we get you to call the fight. Absolutely. That'd we'll be great. That. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, rolling over next to my man, uh, Stoney. But a, a doozy question for you, uh, and it's yeah, you know, it's a lifelong feud at the moment. So we're just I'm unfortunately pulling pouring some petrol in this fire, and I do apologise out there in the Twitterverse. But uh, Stony, if you were challenging Breck ok- Okamoto to anything other than you breaking breaking news before him, what would it be, and how would Brett lose at that as well? Oh, you asked the hard hitting questions there, Sugar Snags. It's like me asking you, think of all the pizzas you've ever eaten in your life, and which one's a favourite. How can you pick just one thing? Uh, look, I've already beat him at the, the breaking news game, so how about a bit of a breaking bones game? I uh, would love to get my hands on Brett Okamoto, but knowing that that would never happen, uh, maybe a virtual fight, UFC 3, a challenge. Uh, wouldn't mind throwing it out there to Brett Okamoto and see if he's not mad enough to come to Australia for the, the next UFC pay-per-view and, and do it in person. Let's, uh, let's get something happening over the, the virtual fighting uh, platform. Look okay. out, hashtag stony virtual fighter. Some good content in that. Yeah, tell me about it. Mate, you went heavy in the paint. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I can tell you my favourite pizza though. Pinky's Pizza. If you've never had it before, there's not many of them left, but my God, it was a delicious treat. Uh, go on to the third one. My man in the other chair that uh, does all the work on the podcast. Thank you. DL, being one of Australia's most well-respected podcast producers, <laughs> if you had a chance to have three people come on your podcast, who would they be that doesn't have to be MMA related? Okay, cool. Well, thanks for saying most respected. I oh, mean, voted by the fans. Mine are podcast related, but one is podcast and fighter related. So oh, really Brendan right. Schwab would be my number one choice. Do like his work behind the mic. Uh, speaks his mind. I like it. Do like his content. It's all good. I do like his food truck diaries, which if you haven't checked that out, check them out. He does interviews with fighters on that, which is really cool. So Brendan Schwab's my first one. Uh, then I'm going a little bit deep on the second one. Sam Harris is my second one to get a little bit more intellectual on the podcast. I use his waking up app for meditation sometimes. It's really good. To bring it back all the way around to sport again, I'm going to take Bill Simmons. I've uh, been listening Ooh. to Bill Simmons' podcast for many, many, many years. If for NBA, NFL, anything like that, it's an amazing podcast. Uh, the content they bring out in the ringer is Second to none, so mate, big fan of that. So there will be my three, all podcast related. Okay, well, yeah, maybe as the years tick along, we'll see these boys pop on the podcast pretty soon. But boys, that is our ISO chat with Snags for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. Next week, please bring your cup of tea uh, or maybe a little red wine as the jazz music plays, and I'll uh, have a new question for you all. Till next week, gents. Stay sugar. <laughs> all right, boys, let's jump into hot take. As the UFC looks to implement changes ahead of the next two cards, Jacare tested positive for COVID-19. Is this proof that the UFC system work? Uh, I would say initially, yes, and other sports should follow suit. I think the nerve 
racking nest would probably be over the next 16 days and if anything comes out of it post fights. But yes, for me. Yeah, a li- little bit mistake on that one. Hindsight's a wonderful thing and I think uh, you can only really judge did this work in the next two weeks. So at this stage, I'm going to say no comment and let's see how it pans out. Completely agree with the boys. Um, I think two weeks from now, we'll be able to see whether or not this is the right decision. I did not like the idea that he was taking photos backstage with uh, like Fabrizio Verdum when he knew that he'd been in contact with a COVID-19 positive person. Um, so maybe the quarantine could have been stricter. Um, but, I mean, the, the fights went off without a hitch, and so far we've had no other positives. So it is what it is. So Hudo announced his retirement at the conclusion of his bout with Cruz. Is he officially done or is he playing the game? Oh, I'm a bit 50-50 with this one, to be honest. I think uh, he could be playing the game, but he could be playing it not only to the UFC, but a couple of different avenues. The Triple C, you know, King of Cringe. I, I could see that man floundering into the world of pro wrestling, um, as a couple of his other counterparts have. And uh, time will tell, but either way, it's sad to see him go if he is gone. Absolutely. Look, it wouldn't be floundering to the UFC. I think uh, Henry Cejudo would take the WWE by absolute storm if he did end up over in Vince McMahon's world. But look, I was waiting for a punchline at the end of his retirement. I thought it was a bit of an angle and then it just never comes. So I'm inclined to think that maybe this is legitimate. And that that comes as a cruel blow for someone who's really followed Henry and uh, been a big fan since his first cross into mixed martial arts. It's It's a sad day if he has decided to hang the gloves up. I'd be I'd be very disappointed if this was the end for Cejudo. He has looked really really good lately. In saying that, uh, obviously show must go on, and Dana has already uh, kind of intimated that Peter Yan will be one of the fighters for the bantamweight title. I'm all in on Peter Yan versus Aljamain Sterling. I reckon that is going to be a banger fight, and if that's for the bantamweight title because Cejudo's actually gone, so be it. <laughs> After Cruz lost, he was interviewed by Joe, claiming no fuss Keith, as known on the podcast, smelt of cigarettes and alcohol. Should the refs be under the same rules as the fighters? Uh, look, I'm going to go no fuss about this one. No pun intended, boys. Now, I think it's a, it's a weird one, but that stoppage was, I think, the wrong call, in my opinion. I don't think they should be under the same rules as the fighters, but obviously there probably should be some sort of screening for the the referees before they jump in the cage. A lot on the line for that fight as well and for that to go down like that when he's clearly getting up. It's disappointing, but is what it is. Absolutely. I wouldn't say the same rules as the fighters, but certainly, you know, when I first heard the comment, cigarettes and alcohol, it sounded like something that, that Colby Covington would say after, um, you know, his loss to, to Usman, he went on a big tirade about Mark Goddard. Uh, Don Cruz, he, he was dead set serious about this, so I have to, you know, take that on face value. Certainly, I think the ref should be under some form of... Uh, oversight that if they're, they're under the influence in any way form or shape then, then absolutely that, that needs to be looked into any job you do uh, you should like you can't do drunk <laughs> so especially if you're refereeing and officiating in a combat sports i was pretty disappointed from the response from dominic cruz though um i think i looked at his response to his loss to cody garbrandt where he was so even-headed and and so uh ready to take on any criticism um that seeing he, he was a little petulant in the post fight, and obviously very disappointed. Um, but I came away from it uh, more disappointed with Dominic Cruz than than anything. As stated on the last episode of Breaking News of Stony, Stony talked about McGregor Diaz three. <coughs> During the broadcast, Connor tweeted, "Sign the contract." Later on in the press conference, Dana later denied there even being a contract. I think it's Connor being Connor, but if I'm being open and honest, I think the next fight for Connor is either going to be Masvidal um, or GSP. <laughs> Just got inducted in the Hall of Fame, boys. Never see him coming back for something like that. That's a left field one, but I say Masvidal <laughs> next. I'm stunned. I don't even know how to follow that. Oh, boys. <laughs> Who are you going to leave? The newsbreaker that's not been wrong yet or Dana White approving <laughs> compulsive liar who's told more lies than truth? I mean, look at his record. He's told us five times we're seeing Tony compete and we haven't seen that once. He told us we'd never see women in the UFC and 12 months later they headlined an event. Trust me, boys, Dana White, 
He couldn't tell the truth to save his life. Don't be fooled. Breaking news with Stoney got that one 100% on the money. You reckon he's throwing shade? Look, I think he's playing the game. I think Nate Diaz has got a bit of a fragile ego and they know that they need to coddle him into a fight these days. So I think Dane is just looking to not get Nate offside, but 100% their contract is sitting with Nate. Okay. Yeah. Honestly, now's the time for the fight. Now is the right time. Um, I would prefer this fight to go down at lightweight, um, at least then if Connor wins, he has more of a more of a right to claim to fight the Khabib uh, and Gaethje winner. But I, I do think I do think that if we're going to believe anyone, Stoney or Dana White, I'd probably go with Stoney on this one. You're a good man, Stat man. Okay, I'm trusting the boys. Solid as always, boys. And that was hot take. We're going to jump into the UFC 249 recap. Statman, do you want to take us through the results of that card? Yeah, absolutely. So we picked for six fights on the card, so I'll take you through those results. So headlining the prelims, uh, Anthony Pettis defeated Donald Cowboy Cerrone, uh, unanimous decision. In the heavyweight division, Greg Hardy defeated Jorgen De Castro by unanimous decision. Um, Calvin Carter, uh, Kadar defeated Jeremy Stevens by TKO with a hellacious elbow. Um, Francis Ngannou defeated Jerzino Rosenstruck by KO in 20 seconds oh. of the first round. Um, Henry Cejudo defeated Dominic Cruz by TKO, knees and punches. And Justin Gaethje defeated Tony Ferguson in the fifth round to win the interim lightweight championship. Boys. Look, I'm going to put it out there for me. My It wasn't fight of the night, but the fight that I enjoyed the most was in the early prelims. Uh, Bryce Mitchell versus oh. Charles Rosa. Oh, Worth a mention. Holy dooly. How many twists? The amount of time. Oh, that's what I was going to say. The amount of times that man went for a twist and I thought he was going to get it two fights in a row. Um, but that ground game by him, especially Rose is a black belt as well. Um, so for that ground game by him was just an absolute masterclass and it was a, a beauty to watch. Just so fun to watch. Like, um, someone said that if there was a crowd in there, we'd probably have some booze because it was just a purely ground, like a ground battle. And I don't reckon you would have. But you don't think so? No, I think because it was always progressing. Yeah. Like when you looked at it, like Rose would make, and to be honest for him, like how esteemed is him, he to fight through all those submission yeah. attempts and escape. Um, I reckon the crowd would have been into it, to be honest. I'd hope so. Um, but a rare 30-24 in that fight as well. It doesn't happen very oh, mate, often. He dominated him, didn't he? Yeah. So, mate, that was my highlight of the card. I know it's not like we had some banging fights and some wars, but I absolutely enjoyed that. And early on, I thought, oh, dang, we're in for a big night here. Greg Hardy was the, the obvious one saying that he wasn't checking the kicks, so he started checking yeah. the kicks and suddenly he was on top, <laughs> which was crazy. But during the commentary, now I've got to watch it again, but during the commentary, I'm sure DC was talking about he's got to watch the head, he's got to watch the head when he was trying to get him in the twister. So yeah. maybe that I little think, reminder, but you'd think your coaches would be yelling that out anyway. Well, I think the difference between him and Greg Hardy is Greg Hardy's pretty new to the sport. Yeah, yeah. he's going to take, belt. yeah. Yeah, he, was, he knew what was going down. But still, I think the cool thing about uh, the announcers and the no crowd as well. Did anyone hear Rogan announcing uh, Ryan Spann as the first winner? <laughs> yeah, no. Ryan Spann, ladies, to no one in the audience. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Got me good. I was legit lolling after that. A little bit of Mike Bisping in the in the fight night uh, a month ago, where oh, after cool. one of the, the wins, he said, "All right, give it up for the winner." <laughs> yeah, no just just crickets. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it that chucked their hat into the crowd as well? Oh, uh, was that Henry on the way out? It, oh, it was Henry sorry. Cejudo, yeah. Oh, of course he it just was. chucked his hat into, into the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking love it. So, but uh, boys, what a card. That Gaethje obviously has destroyed the life and dreams of uh, everyone wanting Ferguson versus Khabib, but mate, how could you not want Gaethje versus Khabib after that fight? So, he put on a masterclass. So exciting. Absolutely. We covered in the group chat a little bit uh, today, Statman himself going back and forward that. You know, heading into this fight, the, the big uh, reservation was what happens if Tony loses? And in my eyes, I was thinking, you know, what happens if Tony's controlling his fight and then Gaethje with that knockout power comes through and, and takes the win from, from, you know, underneath Tony? But in the manner that that fight went and the win, you know, it's really hard to argue. I, I've got to say that I'm moving on from the Tony Khabib a lot, a lot quicker than what I thought was possible. Um, you know, if you had told me this time last week that, that Tony loses and I'm content, uh, I would have challenged that thought. Uh, vigorously, but you know, I've, I've got no doubt that Justin Gaethje and Khabib is the fight that I really want to see now. 
Oh, look out. New kids on the block, boys. This is how it rolls. <laughs> Yesterday's news versus today's. Mate, Tony's chin on that fight, though. Oh. I don't know how he stood and took every single punch that he got put on him, but, mate, commend to him. He didn't lose a... I don't think he lost anything from that fight, to be honest. I have to, I have to wonder how he's going to back up next next fight. It, I, that seems like it's a kind of a beating that maybe changes or maybe takes away somewhat your durability in the future. <laughs> Um, cause I was thinking, oh, cool. Like we could maybe have Tony Ferguson versus Conor McGregor now, but I, even though Tony Ferguson showed such a fantastic chin, I wouldn't want him in the cage with Conor McGregor for his health. Like I, I, I think that we're probably going to see, he's 37 years old. We're probably going to see a different Tony Ferguson now, um, post Justin Gaethje cause Justin Gaethje put it on him. I do feel for Tony a little bit. All his training was for a wrestler mm-hmm. with Khabib. He wasn't obviously wasn't training a full camp for someone that's going to stand up with him the whole time and throw absolute fists um, of steel, um, which was crazy. We know Gaethje hits really, really hard. And as well, Tony, I don't I don't think Tony's lost for like seven years. No, he's what, 12 so short. But you've got to think um, Gaethje's a well-esteemed wrestler as well. Um, he's got a pretty good background on it. Correct me if I'm wrong, Statman. No, he, he, he's got a really, really good pedigree with wrestling, but he doesn't – He I can't remember the last fight he used it in. I don't think he's – he's got really good collegiate wrestling. I don't know if he has good MMA wrestling because he just never uses it. So, Well, keeping a little surprise for the boys, isn't Possibly. he? <laughs> he? I imagine he'd it's have like good takedown every. defense, so maybe. We just touched just back on what Statman said. I think that's such a valid point. We, we don't know this until, you know, months down the track when we see Tony again, but there's been so many examples over the years of, you know, absolute wars where, you know, fight fans can't wait to see these fighters back in the cage and, and they underwhelm. You know, after they've been through such a such an ordeal, and it, the, Rory McDonald, yeah, took the wind out of my sails there. The, the Robbie Lawler and Rory McDonald, both of them, really. You, you look at what they went on to achieve post that one eighty nine, um, you know, bloodbath, that war that they had, and you, you've just got to assume that, that how many years that took off, respectively, both of their careers. We all point to Rory, but you know, let's not look at uh, past Robbie either. So I, I firmly agree that you know, it's as much as I hate to say it, you know, that that could really. Um, be a turning point in Tony's career and, and I struggle to see him really bouncing back given, you know, at the top of that class, you just can't afford any losses. And, it, you know, it pains me to say it because, you know, I feel for the feel for him, you know, enormously, but, you know, that, that's a devastating loss no matter how you look at it. MMA is a cruel sport to have favourites in. It's like, it's hard to oh, watch because if they stick around for long enough, they're going out. Like, um, it's just it's just hard. I think Fedor was the big one for me. Obviously, Lost to Fabrizio, I didn't watch him get knocked out by Dan Henderson, broke my heart because you just don't, never, you never want to see the heroes of your childhood unconscious face down the map, but you're going to see it. Frankie Edgar getting knocked out um, by Brian Ortega, I was like, oh, I just never wanted DC, to see that baby. sight ever. I did, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't think he was going to knock him out. Though. I thought he was going to sub him. But if you if you follow a fighter for long enough, you, you're going to see him hit his peak and pr- probably stick around too long and and g- go out on his shield, which is unfortunate. Yeah, well, all in all, boys, I was absolutely bloody aroused for those fights. <laughs> and I was I was giddy like a, a kid at Christmas when they started. And I was I know a group chat that started early for us in Australia. I think it was 10 a.m. So uh, my day was sold. Next time, please don't put it on Mother's Day. Please. made it rather awkward. <laughs> I thought I got to watch the fights anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that was on Dana's mind at the time. No. no. And the Henry Cejudo Dominic Cruz fight was just insane ending. I thought Cruz looked really good. Yeah. Yeah, same. I think, you know, that was a surprise end. Well, not a surprise ending. He, he caught him by surprise with that knee. Um, yeah, the, the, the read and the connection were, were phenomenal, I thought, yeah. from, from Henry. But at no point, and I take what Dale said, absolutely, Cruz didn't look bad, but. At no point did he show me enough to suggest that, you know, I thought he was going to win that fight. I thought Henry, right from the outset, you know, announced, you know, his presence, um, you know, showed that he, he wasn't going to be reserved. He went straight after him. Those leg kicks were devastating. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen that from Henry ever. And, and, you know, we talk about it, you know, I think I've said it a few times. No one no one improves more between fights, I don't think, than Henry Cejudo. And that's what makes it such a bitter pill to swallow that if he has turned, to, turned his back on, yeah, uh, he's MMA crew for the time being. You know that that's a really tough one because I genuinely don't think we've seen the peak of Henry Cejudo. As funny as that sounds, I, I might be going against the grain here, um, and it goes against me being a huge fan of Dominic Cruz. I didn't actually have too much issue with that stoppage. I thought he he went down and his eyes rolled, 
He came back. He took a lot of unanswered shots on his way back to his feet. And he was he was not so much on his way to his feet. He was on his way to getting on his way to his feet when the referee stopped the fight. So I didn't have a whole lot of issue. I was watching with my partner. She had she was like, oh, that was an early stoppage. I think what actually happened was Keith, per- uh, Keith Peterson probably should have maybe stopped it yeah, before he earlier. Him. And it was almost as if he maybe p- got punched awake or punched into action. And so, like, it's got to be one of those things where you, you stop it now. He, he left it too long to stop it, and it became an early stoppage, which is really weird. But um, I didn't have too much of an issue with the stoppage. It's 50-50, eh? Like, I think good call at some points, then you can argue it as well. So that's why you don't get... Uh Try not to get needy in the face. Try not to. Yeah, it's always good. And just quick comments on the fight only went for 20 seconds. So, (laughs) France Nagano and Rosa Street. Holy bangers. I would not. I think my favorite comment from that fight was DC saying, we need to see Nagano fight for a title, just not against me. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he wants to know that. There was yeah. one leg kick that Jerzino Rosenstruck landed, and I was like, oh, this could be an interesting fight here, fellas. And then <laughs> I was like, hang on a second. This is an interesting... T-. And he was unconscious. He was dead against the cage. Uh, and the <laughs> the um, cold stare down at the opponent, which I think was maybe out of concern that yeah, Engano did. He walked over. It was like a Uriah Hall, Adam Seller moment from The Ultimate Fighter where he was like, I'm sorry, Adam. But Engano was just standing there over the corpse of his latest victim. And I was like, that's, mm, that that's, was fucking intense. That's a devastating it? image. It must be hard without the crowd egging oh, you like, on suddenly because the realisation <laughs> of you just knock someone out comes in really quickly. Because yeah. usually you'd be just like, yeah, pumped, excited. Cheering, yeah. But Probably there's nothing okay and everyone's him. going, oh my God. <laughs> Probably would have been okay if he knocked him out in like round three or four after he's like felt like he's had... Yeah, you know, a fight, but knocking someone out after that, you're probably like, "Oh, bro, I didn't even get hit. Like, I feel mm. really bad." <laughs> but hey, what a banger! Good night, Irene was playing in my head after that finished. <laughs> I think we learned one thing. Yeah, anyone who comes up against Francis, don't go to the leg kicks. It doesn't end well. He's, he's the scary, <laughs> scariest MMI. Like, I think genuinely the scariest person to ever fight in the UFC. He, he, how do you fight that? It doesn't make sense. We well, don't. Like DC said. Yeah. <laughs> Katara and Stevens as well. Obviously, Stevens missed weight for that fight, so gave up 30% of his purse. But, mate, it was as advertised. Good scrap. That elbow was beautiful. I love a good... I love the, the slow motion replay where you just see them just just begin to, like, disappear. They're standing up straight, and then they're just, like, falling down like a building being demolished. It was just... It was yeah. a good fight. And that final fight on the card, there was the Greg Hardy, or first fight, I should say, on the main card, was the DeCastro Greg Hardy fight. Would, are we convinced Greg Hardy is, is the real thing? Uh, yes and no. I think he's got a lot of athletic ability, but I think as he grows, he could become a beast. So it's only two years in the sport, too. Yeah, you just yeah. have to see how he goes. But, mate, I don't. Scary man. Fucking got some confidence about him, that's for sure. So <laughs> Did- we'll see what his next fight brings up. How did everyone score that fight? Because it was it was straight thirty twenty sevens. I was pretty I was pretty on board with giving Jorgen De Castro the first round. Um, uh, I thought look, he came out really really hard and he spent two surprised. minutes on his back. One yeah. I don't know about the other boys, but I don't score fights when I watch them. Just watch them. <laughs> fair, fair. So I didn't. Fair, fair. Maybe we can cut around that. <laughs> 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 that wraps up our main card and we go to the leaderboard. So the leaderboard, it was a great day for our stat man. Well done, stat man. He's Thank back. you very much. He's Thank back. You. So the stat man come in was six. So that was a clean sweep. So none of us Easy. got the prelim. Bonus point. Yep. So no, no bonus points there. So Craig got six winners. That pushes his total up to 25. So stat man coming in hot. Not a good day for our snags. Snag's only got the no. three points. No, it wasn't a great day. I enjoyed the fights, though, boys. That's all that matters. Fighting was the real winner. Fighter was, <laughs> fighting was the real winner. Fighting Sunday. was the real winner. Sunday. So Snag's has actually taken a back seat, and he's dropped to third place after oh. touching the belt with Stoney. Mm. He it's has let go oh. of the belt. Back to 27. Oh, dang. And uh, I had not a bad day. I got four, so that pushed me back up to 28. So we've got some moving pieces here. That gives us our standalone belt holder. Stoney, it's your mate. 
to you. Sounded, sounded good. Sounded real good. Can you say that again? Yeah, oh, this is his walkout good. song. Yeah, that's what, that's the walkout song. Can't wait to who let the dogs out, please. What, what <laughs> points is he on? Boys, there's levels to this, and Snags found out the hard way that you don't come and touch this interim belt without any consequence. Like, you know, DL, if you want to step up and take a shot, then be my guest, but you know how this story ends. I'm coming, boy. I'm coming. <laughs> uh, so Stoney's on 29, so he's just got one point, oh. one point advantage in the game, but it's his belt. He's the standalone champion. So uh, Well done. I commend you. He was the, uh, the co-holder. Now he's the standalone. So well done, mate. Well done. I love that I get a clean sweep and I'm still two points behind third place. <laughs> you had a rough start, but... Hey, mate, you're coming back. <laughs> Did. Let's call you the Stephen Bradbury of this podcast. <laughs> I'll Honestly, take it. If, it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for that donut card that uh, the stat man had, and I can't remember when it was, but there, uh, there was this... was yeah, the first one. We won't, we won't talk about that dark day any more than we have to, but if it wasn't for that, I think the stat man would probably be taking this out. So he's had one blemish on a... You know, so so many times, Dale, you say, you know, it's been a good card for, for the stat man and I still giggle in the, in the corner and think he's still so far That's down, so but far. he's creeping up. He's catching me. And I've got to say, if I'm, I've got my eye on anyone, it's a, it's a stat man. So, you know, don't sleep on the stat man is all I'll say. Recent form, boys, recent form. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> What's exactly? Stoney's always got two edges to his sword. <laughs> yeah, the, one edge is for me, the other one's the love edge for stat man. <laughs> I get the sharp one. I just gave him a compliment before and he's still better. Always gives me the love edge of it. <laughs> Jesus. Like start, calling you, start calling you a Care Bear soon, mate. <laughs> Boys, let's look at some fights. We've got some predictions coming up. We've got two fight cards this week, both in Florida. Uh, we've got May the 14th, which is Thursday afternoon Australian time, and then Sunday afternoon the 17th. So we're looking forward to that back-to-back. So it's not bad if you've... Uh, Got the time during the week, but uh, the nice little Sunday card there. They'll both be free on ESPN, or if you've got uh, any of the subscription services, you can catch it on there. So it's not a pay-per-view, so this should be good. We've only picked two fights from each of these cards. Kragos, let's kick it. Perfect. We'll start with UFC on ESPN 9 with the co-main event. We've got Ben Rothwell versus Ovin Sempru. Uh, so just after Christmas in 1987, a six-year-old Ben Rothwell woke up one morning completely blind. Uh, so his family rushed him to the hospital where he was put into a coma for 11 days with a bout of spinal meningitis. Despite the survival rates being disastrously low, Rothwell managed to pull through, though the disease did end up having lasting effects on both his physical and mental health. Um, I like to think that if you can get through something that severe so early in life it gives you better odds for dealing with adversity later in life and ben rothwell's story actually has a few tragedies dotted throughout throughout it as well so obviously it's given him the strength to carry on uh, and i think he will carry on through this fight as well ovin so is moving up to heavyweight after a reasonably successful run at light heavyweight uh, but i'm taking ben rothwell i think he's too big and too strong it's an unfortunate matchup for osp because Ben Rothwell's uh, the biggest, fast heavyweight, I would say, in the heavyweight division, and I, I'm taking Ben Rothwell. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, that size is going to be a killer, I think, for OSP. But you, you look at his record, he's 2-2 two and two in the last, I think, since mid-2018. This is OSP. And you, you look at uh, who he's lost to when Nikita Krylov and Dominic Reyes, and you look at how you know their respective careers have gone since then, and suddenly it doesn't look so bad. I mean, they're, they're you know fairly high-level competition that he's lost to, and, he, and he's obviously won... On a couple as well, so I don't think he's necessarily in the in the bad form that a lot of people perceive. But I agree, mate. I, I can't see him. You know, size is a big one to, to cover when you're going up to heavyweight. And, and Rothwell, you know, I've, I've never loved him. I, I've never even liked him, if I'm being honest. But he always seems to find a way to, to just get the job done. And um, you know, I have to have to go with that. And I think he's probably going to get it done again. I've actually just noticed that both fights uh, that we're doing predictions for the main and co-main all journeymen. 37 and 12, Rothwell, OSP 24 and 13. The boys have done their journey. Yeah, like Stoney said, mixed records coming up for both of them. I do like OSP. I've watched some really exciting fights from him. Ben's a big bloke. I'm going to go OSP in this one. I think I think he'll get it done. Snags. Look at that. I'm trying to claw back some points, it feels like, from that pick. Look, I am going to go Ben Rothwell, I think, from a perspective of... I reckon it's going to be a close fight, to be honest, boys. It'll be a good fight to watch, but I think Rothwell's going to get it done. 
OSP, you could never count him out, but from my perspective, going Big Ben. Beautiful. Moving on to the main event of UFC on ESPN 9. Uh, we have Anthony Smith versus Glover Tashira in the light heavyweight division. After his successful fight against Alexander Gustafsson, Anthony Smith had some difficulty with scar tissue in his left hand to the point that he could no longer close his hand into a fist after two surgeries led to some complications. Smith's initial plan was quick and pain-free, allegedly. He was going to get his index finger on his left hand amputated. Um, He wanted to get rid of it so he could get back into fighting as quickly as possible. Thankfully, his physical therapist stepped up and used a electrification method to remove and destroy the scar tissue. Uh, and the hand is as as good as it's going to be, Anthony Smith says, which doesn't fill me with an amazing amount of confidence as to how good that fist actually is. Uh, in this fight, uh, we've got Glover Tashira, who's, a again, journeyman. Um, and I'm taking Glover by decision over Anthony Smith. I think Anthony Smith's path to victory in this fight is submission. Glover Tashira in 37 fights has never been submitted and has a fantastic ground game. The Anthony Smith that showed up against Alexander Gustafsson was absolutely fantastic. But again, I did not see him doing the same thing to Glover Tashira. Yeah, it's an interesting one. What, what really concerned me was Anthony Smith struggling to fight off a 30-year-old junkie in his own house. And that hasn't filled me with confidence going against Glover Tashira uh, in the main event of this one. But... You know, then I read the, the Quitters Never Win at Michael Bisping book, and he had a very distinctly similar story where he struggled to fight off just a battle-hardened street thug. And if he can go on and touch gold, then, you know, I've still got hope for Anthony Smith yet. So I'm uh, predicting Anthony Smith by decision in this one. Yeah, it's Anthony Smith for me as well. Both fighters are 4-1 and one from their last five. Uh, so even form coming into it. But Anthony Smith, I don't know. I reckon, I reckon he's got something to prove after that after that break-in. So I think he'd be up and about for it. Quite a difference in age as well. Not that age is going to make a big difference. I think it's like seven or eight years difference in age. Um, Glover is pushing over 40 with Anthony Smith at 31 years of age. So I think the younger Anthony Smith, um, and you know Anthony Smith has been impressive in the ring at recent. I'm looking for Anthony Smith, and I'm going to have a knockout round two. Oh, look out. Uh, I've actually gone the exact same as DL there, Anthony Smith, round two knockout. Um, I disagree with the whole intruder thing. Like, this dude was probably an absolute junkie, and we've heard many stories before about them being absolutely impossible to fight off. Uh, So I would say Smith's got something to prove, also probably to prove uh, after John Jones... I'm going to take a leaf out of the Statman's book here and just be negatorio towards a fighter, but John Jones' stinging barbs uh, side compliment to Anthony Smith. So I think he comes out and TKO's uh, Glover in round two, and uh, I think we'll see the Anthony Smith from last fight come back, which I'm looking forward to. So the intruder is actually was actually a very well-known collegiate wrestler as well, and there's videos of him going around trying to break into other people's houses uh, on, like, dash cams like door cams and the dude is terrified he's obviously off his face he's screaming i'll send you guys the link to the video because it is genuinely terrifying that he's not a guy that you want to find in your house at 4 a.m when you've got a wife and kid upstairs the the video is just horrifying to watch and just knowing that this is the guy that ended up inside uh anthony smith's house so man do you know what i'm more impressed with that man Somehow you've got stats for blokes that don't even fight on the card. He's a clean <laughs> wrestler. Like, tell us his record, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll pull it out. Yep. Yeah. Bring it to the next yeah. party, please. Well, he picked a bad house to go in, but honestly, if he was in the suburbs of you know West Sydney, if he picked the, the wrong house, he, I'd hope for him to run into Sugar Sean. I mean, that, that would have been terrifying for that collegiate wrestler. So Mate, I wear that maybe... forced right white belt to bed. <laughs> Some of those stripes look a little disingenuous. I think you might have painted Guy on a lapel choke. Sharpie. Mate, they're sewed on. They're <laughs> high level way. Cloth stripes, mate. They call him Sharpie. They call him Sharpie down at the gym. Some of this tape over Sharpie this Sharpie snags. <laughs> Sharpie snags. Sharpie snags. <laughs> I'll only go by the words sugar snags or from recent conversations, shooter snags. Oh, a shooter. Hey, boys, I think I hear it. Breaking news with Stoney. Boys, we've got, got some really uh, interesting news on, on this week's segment. So a fan favourite, a personal favourite of the run-it-back, 
podcast, Dan Hooker, uh, was slated to be fighting Dustin Poirier. Now, that hadn't been announced uh, when or where, to my knowledge, but in light of the staggering result on the weekend, there might be a bit of a change um, change in the plans for Dan Hooker. So, after the fight, he made some interesting comments that the Poirier fight is still definitely on the cards, but uh, Tony Fergan... Tony Ferguson is an interesting matchup. He was the number one contender. We'll see how the rankings play out. If he's ranked higher than Dustin, I want the highest ranked fight possible. So I will take Ferguson in a heartbeat. Boys, I've got to say, Dan Hooker is someone who, when he stepped up to fight Edson Barbosa, I bet heavily against him. And I thought that my case was vindicated, that Hooker was good, but he wasn't great. He's done nothing but completely take that theory and blow it out of the water every other fight that he's taken since then. I would love to see him fight. Like, I, I want to see him fight for you, but I would love to see a Tony Ferguson fight for, for our boy Dan Hooker. I think um, maybe uh, Tony Ferguson is probably a better matchup for Dan Hooker than Dustin Poirier. I, 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 and that might be a controversial opinion because obviously Tony Ferguson uh, up until this weekend was on a huge win streak and possibly the most dangerous challenger to Khabib. I think he's a more s- straightforward striker approach to Dan Hooker, which complements Dan Hooker's style nicely. Whereas Dustin Poirier, you don't know where you're going to end up on the ground and what submission you're going to wake up to find yourself in. Um, so I would, I, I think Dan Hooker versus Tony Ferguson, there's violence written all over it. I'd be, I'd be all down for it. Well, the other one was, and Sugar Snags touched on it a bit earlier, was GSP, and, and this is not so much a discussion point, just a bit of a shout-out. So, as Sugar Snags uh, referred to, I think it was in the hot take segment, GSP will be inducted later this year into the modern wing of the UFC Hall of Fame, uh, joining the likes of Forrest Griffin, BJ Penn, Uriah Faber, Ronda Rousey, and, of course, Rashad Evans. Now, I'm not going to say none of them fight again after being in the Hall of Fame. I know Kenny Shamrock did after he was inducted, but generally we don't see fighters again after their induction. So I don't know what that, that spells for GSP. I hope, I hope we see him one last time. But, um, you know, whether we see him or not, you know, hats off to a, a, an unbelievable career. He's someone that I think every UFC fighter who's in the game right now would have idolised at some point in time when they were coming up. And, you know, I couldn't think of a, a more fitting bloke to, to be in the UFC Hall of Fame by the end of 2020. I gave up on the chances of seeing GSP fight again about a year or two after the Johnny Hendricks fight. And obviously he came back and fought and won the title against Michael Bisping, proving me a liar. So I've stopped um, I've stopped making predictions about GSP fighting. I find that if you jump on every rumor or news article about GSP returning to fight whoever, uh, you're going to get tired very, very quickly because they seem to come out once a week. Um, so I'm just I'm just sitting back. If he wants to fight again, amazing. I'll always tune into a GSP fight. If he is done for good, what a career. Uh, what a career. Craig, let's roll into this next uh, fight night. Heading into UFC on ESPN 10, we start with the co-main event, Claudia Gadelia versus Angela Hill. Claudia Gadelia fought Joanna Yedrechek in a title eliminator to challenge Carla Esparza for the UFC Women's Strawweight title in December 2014. Joanna won two on the three judges' scorecards and would go on to capture the title and emerge as the breakout star of the division. However, online the fight caused much controversy with 85% of media outlets giving Gadelia the nod in their fight. The entire division would probably look very, very different had the judges gone the other way. And just based on styles, I'm not entirely sure if Gadelli would have gotten past um, Carla Esparza. So we would have seen a complete change in the strawweight history. Um, as far as this fight goes, I love Angela Hill as a competitor. She always seems to improve as much as any other fighter. She's the only fighter to fight six times in a under a 365-day time frame. And she loves to fight and she gets out there and goes for it. Um, I do think Claudia Gadelia is tip of the UFC division in the strawweight division. So I do see that Claud- Claudia Gadelia should take this one quite easily. Yeah, I'm with you. Claudia's she's got four losses to the record. Nina, uh, Jessica Andrade, and Joanna at times too. The level of competition she's faced far outweighs the competition that, that Angela Hill has faced. And, and, you know, I tend to agree. I think this is going to be a fairly one-sided fight. Um uh, one thing we haven't seen a lot from Claudia, she, she's a black belt, and we haven't seen a, a, a great deal of you know submissions during her 
during her tenure, especially in, in recent years. So I'd love to see her actually bring that out. She's become a bit of a, a decision specialist, whether she's on the right or wrong side of that decision. I'd love to see her come out with a big statement against Angela Hill. So I'd love to see an early sub if possible. So Claudia, if you're tuning in, early sub would, would be great. Both fighters have extremely good social games. But for me, overkill Angela Hill has been elite the last three matches. But I like Claudia for this one. I really do. I think Claudia is going to take it. I think she is a step up in her opponent. I think Angela Hill, as like her opponents have been great, great opponents, but I think this is a step up. So I'm going to take Claudia Gedalia for this one. I love going after you because I hear you go, do you know what? This person is doing this and then I'm going to go the complete opposite. <laughs> You do it now every, every time. time. I thought you were going to do it with um, Anthony Smith before too. That's my pick style. Uh, God, you want everybody. me to critique the way you pick? No, nah, short and sharp, baby. We already know that. Sugar value. Can't wait for that. Uh, boys, I think interesting fight coming up. Uh, obviously, Hill's coming off a three-fight win streak, um, but Claudia is an absolute beast. Um, and I think why it will be pretty close, probably closer than a lot of other people think. I think Claudia is going to get the W. Um, how that goes down will be up to the MMA gods, but Snags is looking forward to another absolute banging strawweight fight um, in the women's division, and I think Claudia gets the win. Let's roll on to the main event of UFC on ESPN 10, Alistair Overeem versus Walt Harris in the heavyweight division. I don't know if I used his correct title, Alistair Overeem. Perhaps we should start calling him Prince Alistair Overeem. Um, so let me take you on a bit of a history tour, guys. King William III of the Netherlands uh, had four kids legitimately with his wives and dozens of children outside of his marriage because he liked to sleep around a little bit. Uh, one of these children was Alistair Overeem's great-grandfather on his mother's side. Alistair Overeem has a bit of royal blood in him. Um, as far as my pick for this fight goes, uh, we've got Walt Harris who hits like a truck against Alistair Overham who gets hit like a truck. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm taking Walt Harris. My only question is what round will Alistair Overham get disappointingly KO'd in? Uh, I'm going with three and it's going to be a typical Alistair Overham fight. He comes out, he strikes, he looks amazing and you go, oh shit. Alistair's back, guys. He's going to win this fight, and it's going to, and then he's going to be unconscious. That's how it's going to go. Uh, Walt Harris, KO in the third. Look, I'd love to give my prediction. I don't think I can until you tell me a little bit about Walt Harris's genetic background, stat man. Uh, I, I want an even playing field. What, what's his, his bloodline look like? Peanut farmer, actually. Okay. <laughs> <Is it>? No. <laughs> <laughs> you said that with yeah, such no. confidence. <laughs> I was yeah. nervous. I actually traced his ancestry you. back 250 years. It's stunning. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, look, Walt Harris, I, I can't I can't see my, my man over him winning this one. But you know what? When you're one tip clear, you've got that house money. Oh. I'm, gonna, I'm getting on the house money, uh, house money curse, as many refer to it in the industry. That is. Uh, Jumper, yeah, I can't tip against Alistair Overeem. I just love the man too much, even though I agree that it's probably a poor pick, but um, I'm jumping on Alistair Overeem. I'm going to, I thought he looked great against, uh, in his last fight um, with Rosenstroke. He, he edged him out for, you know, four minutes and 55 seconds of the um, the, the fifth round and had the, the first four rounds in the bank as well. Uh, technically, and, and um, he fought a brilliant fight. So I, I'm imagining he's going to do something similar. So I'm not saying a wild KO or anything like that. So I'm going to, so it's going to be a bit of an underwhelming. There's no KOs in this main event. It's going to be Alistair Overeem by decision. Well, I think the royal blood got knocked out of Alistair Overeem during the Francis Nagano fight. I saw that sail into the uh, yonder. That's gone. For me, it's Walt Harris. I think Walt's got this. I think Walt's last two matches have been outstanding. He's looking a totally different fighter. Alex Overeem is one of those fighters that you don't know what you're going to get. We know he's got the power. Mate, he's 45 and 18. He has done a hell of a lot of fights. That's just his MMA record too when you factor in his his kickboxing career as well. Walt Harris, the big ticket. I'm on him. Uh, decision. Uh, decision, by the way. Decision. Just decision. Okay, look out. Look for snags. I can't go past Walt Harris in this fight. I think I saw the promo for it, obviously, and it's well decorated. His story in the last couple of months uh, leading up to this fight and the heartbreak that he had in his life. So I think he's coming in with a bit of... 
probably extra force behind him, and that's a scary thought considering the power that he's got in in those punches. So um, I think we see a very determined and laser-focused Walt Harris, and uh, Snags is going heavy on this one. I've got my boy Walton. I'm backing him in heavy. I'm backing him for a round one TKO. Um, so I think we get a nice short and sweet fight. Maybe not as short as Nagano, but I, I think we see some big bangs come out, and they're coming straight directly from the fists of Walt Harris, boys. You heard it here first. Beautiful, boys. And that's our picks for the two fight nights this week. Uh, just to round out our picks, it was trending last week. Hashtag sugar value. Thought we'd bring you our best sugar value bets for this weekend. I've gone three dogs. Um, so I've taken a uh, parlay with Dan Ige, Brian Kelleher, and Nate Landwehr. Um, all three are slight underdogs. They're paying nine thirty in a parlay. Um, so I'm going to chuck ten bucks on that for a ninety three dollar return. Look, boys, uh, going from a ninety three dollar return to somewhere in the scope of seven hundred eighty one fifty six. What's going for the big sugar? That's value. what I call snags value. Snags okay, value. put the hashtag in front of it, boys. Snags is not going to deliver any uh, small parlays. Snags is going to go full hog. And for the listeners at home, I've only got a three three fight parlay. Okay, and I've stuck to uh, MMA cleanly. I wanted to give a bit of extra value and add in Scomo's tie for his presser on Friday, but it wouldn't let me add it into my multi, unfortunately. So, boys, what I've got is I've got a uh, I've got a bit of a theme here. I've got a bit of a Hernandez theme because I do like these boys. So I've got uh, Alexander the Great Hernandez. Um, I've got him by either TKO or submission. So either at paying $4.33 uh, over Drew Dober. Um, and then we go into Anthony Hernandez, which I love his name, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez, uh, over Kevin Holland, just paying a $1.90. So that's just going to go in there and get our uh, parlay up a little bit. And then we go straight into the absolute left field. Not really left field, but this one's a bit more... Uh, bit more difficult to difficult uh we've got ray borg over ricky simon even though i love my boy ricky simon uh by submission paying nine dollars fifty uh which that is 78 dollars put 10 bucks on that bad boy and you come out 781.56 tell me that's not sugar snags value shooting from the hip baby let's get on it <laughs> mine's gonna look a little bit boring so i've just gone drew dover for the submission taking the 15 dollar value uh for that that's any round submission 15 bucks Ten dollar investment, one hundred and fifty bucks. You'd be pleased to know, Dale. That's actually jumped up to eighteen uh, just oh, recently. So oh, yeah, throw some extra sh- sugar I think value. Because they that. heard they heard the sugar value over here, giving the old <laughs> tea <guy also. laughs> Sprinkle a little sugar on that one. Don't you worry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm glad you went first, Dale, because I was going to say I, I feel mine's going to be a bit boring after the the three leg parlays of the first two lads. Uh, going in in direct contrast. So you look at a Drew Dober. His last three losses have been submission. Alexander Hernandez is a brown belt. Uh, he'd be looking to make a bit of a statement. He was on a big run. People forget this. He was being pushed as you know a genuine contender and, and the next one of the next big things. And I, I think they fed Donald Cerrone to to make a bit of a name off Donald. Um, you know, use him as a stepping stone, and that just went horribly wrong because Donald uh, stepped up to the plate with a head kick and put Alexander the Great out. You know, I, I've got all the time in the world for Alexander Hernandez. I think he's going to be a real force in the UFC, um, and I think he's going to make a statement in this one. So I'm jumping on him by sub, $9.50. You know, it doesn't have the sugar value of the other boys, but it's got the stony certainty that that will happen. So oh, look, yeah. um, j- jump on it. I'm going Alexander Hernandez, any round, submission, $9.50. Now, Stony for that one, is that hashtag spelled with an S? Stony certainty with an S? <laughs> Yeah, it would have to, mate. You've got to get back on these double, bloody double numbers yeah. here. Well, boys, that rounds out our podcast today. That wraps up episode 25. Um, like always, if you like what we're doing, hit us up on all our socials. We've just launched a lot of our interviews um, on YouTube. So if you're liking that content, jump on and subscribe to the YouTube channel. I uh, really appreciate that support. So that's it, boys. Episode 25 in the books. Uh, my name is Daniel. My name is Shooter Sugar Snacks. My name is Craig. And my name is Tony. We'll run it back with everyone next time on the Runner Back Podcast. I'll tell you who Hernandez runs and reminds me of. Alex? Yeah, Zahudo. Yeah? Most wrestlers, both a little bit cringy. Yeah. Sorry. Alan Alex.
Al- Alex kind of just, he weirds me out a little bit. I reckon he went too cocky in that fight against Cerrone. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know if it was cockiness or whether it was his moment. Too. Maybe Too, too early, too soon, and you know Donald's a, an old, old horse. He's it's not his first rodeo, and he certainly you know, ducked the, the high stakes there. Yeah, 